Aloha, I'm Gerard Elmore, and welcome to another episode of Hawaii's Real Stories. On today's show, we take a look at the South Pacific. The Bishop Museum produced Under a Jarvis Moon about Hawaii students stationed in the South Pacific before World War II. Mason and Regina Farish produced a short film about Big Island cowboy Hakua Purdy for the Hawaiian Paneolo Society. Kauai attorney and filmmaker Terry Tico turned her camera on the future of South Sea Islanders as ocean levels have risen in the past decade. Meliana Meyer explores her family's participation in the protest against annexation after the 1893 overthrow of the Hawaiian monarchy. Here's Noel Kahanu on producing her grandfather's story under a Jarvis moon with the Bishop Museum archives. 2,500 miles off the coast of California, a string of islands known as Hawaii felt the ripple effect of the Depression and the New Deal programs of President Roosevelt. But nothing affected these isolated islands in the Pacific more than the new technological advances of the day. Aviation was the grand new experiment that businessmen and government alike shared a keen interest in. Air travel now offered an opportunity of expanding its reach beyond borders. The U.S. government embarked on its own well-designed plan, reaching into the Pacific to colonize islands thought to be important for emergency refueling for commercial airlines, but instead became the listening posts of the Pacific. Beginning in 1935, uh, young Hawaiian men, predominantly, were sent from Hawaii to live on remote desert islands in the middle of the equatorial Pacific. They lived there in groups of four for basically three to four months at a time, and then they were rotated off. The title of the documentary is called Under a Jarvis Moon. Uh, and it's really a title that's inspired by a song that my grandfather wrote. What was uh, amazing about finding the logbook and looking at it was recognizing the handwriting of my grandfather. So uh, he's still with us, he's 92 years old, um, but these logbooks were written when he was 17 years old. The original recruits were almost exclusively from Kamehameha schools, but over time it began to include students from Roosevelt, Farrington, McKinley. So all told, there were 130 young men uh, that went to go live on these islands. The stated purpose was to support commercial aviation. Howland and Jarvis and Baker were midway between Australia and California. So the initial justification is commercial aviation. However, clearly um, from the very beginning there are military overtones and ultimately that bears out to be true because the islands ultimately come under attack. In experiencing the December 7th attack, we were unaware that the attack had taken place. Our radios had gone out. So it wasn't until two or three days after the attack that we learned that we were at war with Japan. Uh, we found out by, when we were transmitting weather reports to the Coast Guard's radio station here, we were told to get off the air and stay off the air that we were at war with Japan. The day after Pearl Harbor is bombed on December 8th of 1941, there's an air raid on Howland Island and two of the four colonists die from, from injuries received in that attack. Howland Island became a focal point of the Pacific War within the first few hours of, after the attack on Pearl Harbor. In the afternoon of December 8th, Flights of planes in two waves came over the island and dropped bombs. Uh, some of those missed the island and landed in the offshore, but others did not, and they wounded two of the Hawaiian boys that were there mortally. Dickie and Joe were like uh, 15 feet away from us. And like I say, it's all mounds and stuff like that. So apparently they got up, they must have got up to get up when they stopped dropping all the bombs because they, uh, they had shrapnel uh, well, on the chest, they had shrapnel on his, uh, Dickie had shrapnel on his chest, went right through. Both of them were, had, had these wounds. Uh, so 
once war is on, they end the colonization project and they, they remove the, the remaining colonists from these islands. We were rescued from the island on February 9th, 1942. Our arrival in Honolulu, we were told, get yourself a job within a week to 10 days or you'll be inducted into the military. Good luck. We came back and we were in Pearl Harbor for about three, four days. And when they did release us, don't say anything, don't say this, don't say that. What the hell are you going to say then? So anyway, naturally we're not going to say anything except to, you know, friends and family and stuff like that. But uh, that's the way it went. Um, you know, I really felt like this deserved for the community to know this. I thought to myself, not only are we losing the generation that went, but we're losing the second generation that also had heard firsthand. Heather Juni came on board really early in the process to guide this through, and she's been wonderful to work with, and our editor is Lisa Altieri. So that, the three of us really are, are the ones that have kind of worked to pull this together. The ending has yet to be written, in my mind. We ended up interweaving this story of finding the log books and researching the reburial in 2003, all these things that ends up being very personal. So the response has been overwhelming and though they're gone, their families are still here. And even if it's not your family, you will look on that list of 130 names and you will recognize a neighbor, uh, somebody you went to high school with. Like all these names are recognizable to those that, that have lived here for even a short period of time. So to me, this is a long forgotten story that is as relevant today as when it first happened. And it's an example of museums and what they can do at their very best, which is to remember lost stories, to tell them with grace and with affection uh, and with care. At the end of the day, it's a celebration of community. And we'll be right back.